morning, happy Monday. Um, let me give you a brief rundown of what we're going to be doing this week before we get started. So this week, I thought I would tie in something that I think I briefly mentioned in one of the videos last week, which is the story of Terry Jo Depero and um, her adventures lost at sea. So for you guys, I'm going to be doing these videos as per normal, but you're going to be reading some companion articles that I have tracked down for you that are also about other people in a similar situation to our friend Louie, Mr. Zamperini. So um, I think they're, I think you're going to find them really interesting. Um, they kind of run the gamut between um, Louis, which is World War II, and then Terry Joe, which is in the 70s, and then um, Alvarenga, which is um, modern. I think it just happened five or six years ago. So uh, you're going to read these stories, and there's some questions attached. The one thing and the one reason I wanted to make sure that I talked to you about it is... Um, I gave 7th and 8th grade the same set of questions, but they're labeled. So if the question says number 2 and then it says 7th grade, who do you think answers that question? Hmm. Probably 7th grade, right? And then um, if it says both, that's both 7th and 8th grade. And then if it just says 8th, 8th grade answers it. You know the drill, right? Um, we're not doing any IXLs this week. We're not going to do a reading log. We're not doing daily language review. Um, the Terry Joe article is kind of long, and I wanted to make sure that you had enough time to read both of these articles, answer the questions, because the questions are not easy questions. If you answer it with one sentence, it is unacceptable. All of them are, they're, they're not easy questions to answer. I don't just want a yes or no. I want you to explain your answer. Some of it is going to require that you use your notes that we've taken. And if you can't find them because you ate them, don't eat your notes. They're not tasty. Paper doesn't taste good. I can say this from experience. It, it just it tastes like nothing. Um, anyway, guys, uh, use your notes if you need to for a uh, point of view. Um, mood and tone and that kind of stuff that stuff is in your notes okay and if you can't find your notes a copy of all the notes is posted to classroom all right um let's see uh the work for last week is technically due today because i forgot about um being off on friday kind of forgot what week we were on i apologize um and so since it's sort of a short week because of that, I didn't want to give you another IXL and then sort of overwhelm you. So that's where we're at. Um, you're going to like this chapter, I think. I, I mean, this, this part of the book I think is really interesting. So I'm curious to see what you guys think. Because what I'd really like to have happen is for you guys to watch all the videos and to read the articles and then on Friday we can talk about it because I really, really cannot wait to hear what you guys think because especially the Terry Joe um, article, holy cow, that is a crazy story. Um, a teacher I used to work with um, originally told me this story and we, we actually worked together uh, to put this together for... Um, high school students and so I've modified it a little bit but this is a wild story I think you're gonna really find it really interesting so anyway um, you have that to look forward to it'll be posted to classroom by the time you're watching this video chapter 13 missing at sea I don't know why I flipped this around there is no picture I'm so used to doing it that I just did it Joe Deasy landed Daisy May on Palmyra late that afternoon, having seen no trace of Corpening's plane. That night, he received stunning news. Green Hornet had never landed. Holy smoke, he said. Two planes were now down, taking 21 men with them. Dude, that is so many guys on just two planes. A rescue effort was organized. Because Daisy May and Green Hornet had flown together at first, 
The organizers knew Green Hornet had gone down after Daisy Mae left it, but before it reached Palmyra. That was a stretch of 800 miles. In the whirl of currents in that area, survivors could be drifting in any direction. The search area would have to be enormous. At dawn, the search planes took off. Louis woke with the sun. Mac lay beside him. Bill lay in his raft, his mind still fumbling. Only the sharks stirred. Louis decided to divvy up breakfast. He reached in the raft pocket. The chocolate was gone. He looked at Mac. Mac looked back at him with wide, guilty eyes. The realization that Mac had eaten their only food rolled hard over Louis. He knew they could die without it, but he quelled the thought. They'd be rescued today, perhaps tomorrow, he told himself, and the chocolate wouldn't matter. Curbing his anger, he told Mac he was disappointed in him, but understanding that Mac had acted in panic, he reassured him they would soon be rescued. Mac said nothing. The night, gave, the night chill gave way to a sweltering day. The men were hungry, but they could do nothing about it. The fishing gear was useless. There was no bait. As they lay in silence, a purring sound drifted between their thoughts. Searching the sky, they saw a bomber, well to the east, flying much too high to be a search plane. It was probably headed to Palmyra. Louis lunged for the flare gun, loaded it, aimed high, and squeezed the trigger. The gun bucked in his hand, and the flare streaked up. As it shot overhead, Louis shook a sea dye pack into the water. A pool of vivid yellow bloomed over the ocean. Louis, Phil, and Mac watched the bomber, hoping, hoping. Slowly, the flare sputtered out. The bomber kept going. Ben was gone. The sighting gave the castaways a distressing piece of information. They hadn't known in which direction they were drifting. Since the Hawaii Palmyra flight lane ran near Green Hornet's crash site, the appearance of a bomber far to the east meant the rafts were drifting west, away from the view of friendly planes. Their chances of rescue were already dimming. That evening, the search planes returned to their bases. No one had seen anything. They'd be back up at first light. Phil slept for most of the following day. Louie thought about food. Mac hunkered down. For another day, rescue didn't come. On the third morning, they again heard engines. Then there it was, a B-24, low and right overhead, plowing through the clouds. A search plane. Louis fired the flare gun. The flare shot at the bomber, and for a moment, the men thought it would hit the plane. It missed, passing alongside and making a fountain of red. Louis reloaded and fired three more flares. The plane was Daisy May. Its crewmen were straining their eyes at the ocean, passing binoculars between them. But with clouds closing and parting, searching was extremely difficult. The flares died and Daisy May flew on. No one aboard saw anything. The castaway's best chance of rescue was lost. Every hour, they were farther west. If they weren't found, their only hope would be to find land. Ahead, there wasn't a single island for some 2,000 miles. If, by some miracle, they made it that far alive, they might reach the Marshall or Gilbert Islands. Then they'd have another problem. Both sets of islands belonged to the Japanese. Watching Daisy May fly away, Louie had a dark feeling. I have a picture of the Daisy May. It says, Daisy May shown after a forced landing. The castaways' bodies were declining. They drank the last of their water and were intensely thirsty and hungry. They spent another frigid night, then a long fourth day. They knew if the search hadn't been called off, it soon would be. On the fifth day, Max snapped. After having said almost nothing for days, he suddenly began screaming that they were doomed. Wild-eyed and raving, he couldn't stop shouting. Louis slapped him. Mac went silent. As the lost men drifted into oblivion, their last letters reached their loved ones who had not yet been informed of what had happened. To avoid needlessly alarming family members, military policy was to search for a week before officially declaring men missing. In his last note to Ceci, Phil wrote of the moon over Hawaii and how it reminded him of the last time he saw her. I'm waiting for the day when we can begin doing things together again as we used to, he wrote. I love you, I love you, I love you. 
On the weekend after the crash, the Zamperinis had a merry visit with Kupernol's parents, who lived in Long Beach. Pete, now a Navy officer stationed in San Diego, wrote, wrote Louie about it, asking him to tell Kupernol his parents were doing great. He tucked a photo of himself in the envelope. On the back, he wrote, Don't let him clip your wings. As his brother's letter made its way toward Hawaii, Louie was on a raft far out in the Pacific. For the first time since he was a little boy, he prayed speaking the words only in his mind. A week after Green Hornet vanished, the search was abandoned. Phil's crew was officially declared missing, and the process of informing family members began. On Oahu, an officer walked into, into the quarters that Louis, Phil, Mitchell, Mitchell and Kupernol sh sh that Louis, Phil, Mitchell, and Kupernol had shared. He was there to catalog the men's belongings and send them home. Louis's room was mostly as it had been when he'd left that Thursday morning. A footlocker, a diary that ended with words about a rescue mission, a pinup of at actress Esther Williams on the wall. The note Louis had left on the locker was gone, as was the liquor. In Princeton, Indiana, on Friday, June 4, 1943, Kelsey Phillips, Phil's mother, received a telegram. And it's written in all caps because it's a telegram, but I'm not going to yell it. <clears throat> I regret to inform you that the Commanding General Pacific Area reports your son, First Lieutenant Russell A. Phillips, missing since May 27. If further details or other information of his status are received, you will be promptly notified. At Camp Pickett in Virginia, the same news reached Phil's father, who was serving as an Army chaplain. He took leave and rushed home. The telegram reached the Zamperinis that same evening. Louis's mother, Louise, called Sylvia, who was living in a nearby suburb with her new husband. Sylvia became so hysterical that a neighbor ran to her, but Sylvia was crying too hard to speak. Sobbing, she got in her car and drove to Torrance. Pulling up at her parents' house, she put on a brave face. Her father was quiet. Her mother was consumed with anguish. Sylvia, who, like everyone else, assumed Louis had crashed in the ocean, told her mother not to worry. With all those islands, Sylvia said, he's teaching someone hula. Pete arrived. If he has a toothbrush and a pocket knife and hit, he hits land, he said, he'll make it. Louis found the snapshot taken the day Louise found the snapshot taken the day Louis left when he'd stood beside her on her front steps, his arm around her waist. On the back, she wrote, Louis reported missing, May twenty seventh, nineteen forty three. Stanley Pillsbury and Clarence Douglas were in the hospital, trying to recover from the wounds and curved over Nauru. Douglas's shoulder was ravaged, and he seemed emotionally gutted. Pillsbury still couldn't walk. In his dreams, planes dove at him endlessly. Pillsbury was in his bed when Douglas came in. The crew went down, he said. Pillsbury could barely speak. His first emotion was overwhelming guilt. If I had only been there, he said later, I could have saved it. On Oahu, Louis's friends hung a small flag in his memory. It would hang there as Louis, Phil, and Mac drifted west and the Allies carried the war across the Pacific and into the throat of Japan. In Torrance, Louis Zamperini's, Louise Zamperini's hands broke out in weeping sores, a consequence of her emotional trauma. Somewhere in those jagged first days, a fierce conviction came over her. Her son, she was absolutely certain, was alive. See you in the next video.